Thanks very much. I might go over a bit, but I'll try to be charming while I do it, so <laughs> please, please forgive. So my paper is titled Practical Theology in Scotland, Theology for and by the Disinherited. Uh, I'm taking advice from Dr. Eric Stoddard here, uh, who in his most recent book said quite rightly that a key criticism of practical theology is our insatiable desire to never name things. I find this idea of categorizing far more interesting in the animal kingdom than in theology. However, because we are, at the moment, still operating within a high academic context, I hope I can take you on a bit of a journey on how I see this disinherited status as being the positive future of practical theology. So the name of my talk was originally Theology uh, That Liberates, because anytime I can get that word into anything, it's, uh, it's great. Um, but by way of reading some uh, Richard Niebuhr and Howard Thurman, it has morphed into Practical Theology for and by the Disinherited. I'll quote Niebuhr directly here. He writes, but the new faith became the religion of the cultured, of the rulers, of the sophisticated. It lost its spontaneous energy amid the quibblings of abstract theologies. It sacrificed its ethical rigorousness and compromised with the policies of government and nobilities. The lower strata of society find themselves religiously expatriated by a faith which neither meets their psychological needs nor sets forth an appealing ethical ideal. Thurman further explores the idea of the disinherited, saying that any loss of inheritance leads to an existence of creative survival. Quote. Throughout my paper today, I will be coming back to this theme of losing religious citizenship and this incredibly important phrase, creative survival, both in reference to practical theology as well as practical theology in Scotland specifically. I will talk about how, through creative survival, the people who call themselves practical theologians have paved a way for what I believe are the most exciting projects in theology at the moment. So to begin, I'd like to talk a bit about how I see this theme in relation to practical theology. Uh, I wanted to go through some of the developments uh, of practical theology in general, but as everyone has said, we have a limited amount of time. Uh, and I'm among friends, uh, so I don't need to necessarily go through um, all the works of Don Browning, which has been mentioned, and Schleiermacher, uh, who we really don't want to get into. So I won't go into a great detail about their work, but I will acknowledge uh, that I am greatly appreciative and indebted to their contribution. Uh, and I'm especially indebted um, because most uh, of their work uh, and the work of the people that followed means that I have a post uh, in the university setting in practical theology. So instead, my specific focus today is going to be on one historical issue within the academy in relation to practical theology, and that is uh, this, this battle that continues between the ideas of theory and practice, a topic that Duncan Forrester tackled in his book, Truthful Action. Those of you who are at the research seminar here at New College will have heard this idea before, uh, so bear with me. But increasingly, I have observed a new trend that sees PT as being an and discipline. For instance, I do systematic theology and a bit of practical theology, or I do sociology and a bit of practical theology. Uh, this is not to discredit the absolute need for practical theology to be interdisciplinary, but what began to bother me was the fact that theologians and social scientists, as well as philosophers and the like, kept using practical theology as an afterthought or a subdiscipline to tag onto their primary work. In other words, why has practical theology moved from being the crown of the theological disciplines to being seen as a less than legitimate form of doing theological research? Why is it a disinherited theological area of, the stud of study within the academy? In his book, Truthful Action, Duncan Forrester quotes Martin Luther. Divinity, said Martin Luther, consists in use and practice, not in speculation and meditation. Everyone that deals in speculations, either in household affairs or temporal government or elsewhere, without practice is lost and worth nothing. 
While this is a strong statement by Luther, it highlights what has long been a disconnect between theory and practice and theology. Like many disciplines in a post-Enlightenment world, practice was placed at a lower level than theory. One being seen as scientific, philosophical, systematic, the other as subjective and not being able to be measured in a way that is consistent, logical, or objective. Like everything else during this time, the arts felt like they needed to catch up, theology especially. How do you measure God? How can you logically speak of the divine? What system can analyze God? The obsession with attributing scientific regulation into theology was clear. Systematic theologians interpret the truth, the heavenly things, in a logical way that is based on history and established central doctrines that create a means by which one can measure. Those who research what is happening when you introduce these doctrines into the general public, into the community, those are the practical theologians. Theirs is a subjective reality and hard to recreate. It is also filled with emotions, thoughts, and feelings, the ultimate enemy of logic. Practical theologians reacted to this theory and practice conundrum by adopting methods from other disciplines to continue researching their topics of choice. This, in many ways, could be linked uh, to our loss of citizenship status. However, it would seem that this loss within the theological nation has been woefully misguided. I think this move towards some sort of purification of theology is a romanticizing of theology itself. The idea that we are doing anything more than trying to figure out who God is and the workings of God in the world, and that a few of us, practical, systematic, historical, public, or political, have the right answers definitively in this regard is a dangerous road to walk. We are at best using what we know from past works on theology, history, the Bible, and the context in which we live to interpret and ask questions about the essence of God, and perhaps with an added sprinkle of divine inspiration here and there. Duncan Forster said, quote, practical theology is the branch of theology which is concerned with questions of truth in relation to action. This points to a deep reciprocal nature between theory and practice. While those of us who do practical theology embrace this dialogue between theory and practice, between doctrine and humanity, it was met with suspicion by some, called applied theology by others, and our inherited status within the theological disciplines morphed into a feeling of either disregard or confusion by some of our theological colleagues. So how does this theme of the disinherited move into a discussion of Scotland? Prior to the disruption, practical theology didn't appear in the theological curriculum for ministers in any of the ancient universities. Gaining momentum after the First World War, there began a move, mostly by Church of Scotland ministers, to create a space for pastoral or practical theology. And this met with quite a lot of opposition in the beginning. In 1901, Professor Blackie was appointed as the lecturer on a newly formed course on pastoral theology. He wrote, quote, at that time, pastoral theology was, ra was rather in disrepute. Students came from the class of logic and metaphysics permeated by the conviction that there is nothing greater in the world but man and there is nothing greater in man but mind. The impression in general that the objective of the Divinity Hall was to cultivate the theological intellect and that if that were done, nature would supply all the rest. It was necessary, therefore, to create, in the first instance, a sense of value. End quote. We again see here this disconnect between theory and practice, between the mind and that which is lived, the need to validate practical theology as a discipline that was more than just hints and tips for ministers in the parish. It was a huge undertaking for the pioneers of this movement within the university setting in Scotland. But they did prevail, though it took many years, and in Scotland today we are living in the legacy of those who felt the need for practical theologians in the academy. We still have chairs in PT, and all of the ancient universities have at least one lecture with this, in their, this name in their title. And this is perhaps a clearer and more practical indication of why I believe that Scotland has such a distinct legacy of practical theology, why, why they have embraced us in all of our weirdness. And yet while we still exist within the structures of the university, old worlds such as those of Blackie still seem to ring true. So what are practical theologians who hold these titles doing about highlighting the value of practical theology in a university setting? When I walked into the room last night, I was met with a sea of faces that almost brought tears to my eyes. Generations of practical theologians embracing and reminiscing, speaking of the past and talking of the future. Julian began uh, the night by speaking of those who had been head of CTPI in years past, and one of those mentioned was Cecilia Clegg, my PhD supervisor, and the first person to inform me that what I was doing was, in fact, practical theology. 
When I was so graciously described by Doug last night as working on reconciliation in Northern Ireland, that was in no small part to the glorious influence uh, of this incredible woman. My first uh, uh, job post-PhD was at the University of Glasgow, which was very kindly mentioned, uh, with uh, Heather Walton and Doug Gay, who are to me uh, like family. As a newly designated practical theologian, there was no better place for me to learn and cultivate what it meant to hold this title in a Scottish context. We all had different corners of PT. Heather would speak of the arts and poetry uh, and really anything that she would speak of, and I would nod in amazement and act like I knew what she was talking about. Um, Doug would passionately speak of the Church of Scotland and Scotland itself, and as an American, I would take vigorous notes, though don't, maybe don't tell him so much. I think you left, so don't tell him that part. Um, we learned from one another in an environment that was supportive and inspired by what was happening in practical theology. It was at Glasgow that I became an evangelist for this type of theological research. It was at Glasgow also that I met the likes of John Swinton and Eric Stoddard, Elaine Graham, Zoe Bennett, and Stephen Pattison who embraced me as an equal from the very beginning, mostly as a result of my VIP status with Doug and Heather, I'm sure. Um, and much like walking into the room last night, I found myself a part of a small family within this ever-present, brutally competitive academic life that we are living. And at the most recent BIOP conference, I sit with students like uh, Katie Cross and Haley French and Connor Fegan, wherever they are, uh, at the University of Aberdeen, and they tell me their struggles with being a practical theologian and how much they love the subject. And I know this story, and I bring them into the family as well. I hope they feel that. And so we go, affirming, loving, and creating an inherited space for those misfits who come across our paths. And in some ways, I do think that makes us unique in the academy, and delightfully so. We name check each other not for status, but because we are all part of this wider family. And when a family member succeeds, we are proud. Like a child doing a Christmas play, these are the faces you search for in the crowd because you know at the end that they will say, well done. Or, well done, but you probably should have said this instead of that. Uh, we aren't without our critiques, after all. And all that's important, to bring an idea, perhaps a wacky one, to a colleague who says, sure, let's try it. There's still work to be done here, but I believe we're creating a spectacularly safe yet creative space for students of practical theology from different walks of life and different religious faiths to work together under the same banner. And this space is not limited to students. I originally did my own research in the area of peace building and reconciliation, but recently I've moved to look more closely at what I refer to as the dark side of practical theology. The practice of theology that is not so affirming, that is oftentimes rooted in scripture and doctrine, but the kind that enslaves people or creates systems, resulting in overwhelming burdens on the mind and body. Systematic theologies of oppression that dialogue with practical theologies of violence. This is a new project, but I'm very excited and equally terrified about it. And I never would have attempted it in a million years if not for the knowledge that I have these members of the Practical Theology family that will help me along the way and absolutely tell me if what I'm doing is rubbish. In a loving way, of course. So what is the future of Practical Theology in this context of Scotland? In many ways, I believe it is to continuously define ourselves not only in relation to what we mean by Practical Theology, but also in conversation with other theological disciplines. We should maintain our focus on the disinherited, and we should look at how our theological work might be translated and used in the context of the world we live. We should be confident in being contextual, as well as being unafraid to be specific about the subjectivity that comes with the contextual. We should not conform or shy away for the sake of misunderstanding by our peers. We should show, through good research and even better practice, that practical theology belongs at the forefront of the academy. We should create our own methods of research and our definitions within the discipline, structures to abide by that are our own. And then I hope we will take those structures and knock them down and rebuild in accordance to the inspired dialogue of theory and practice in this world. And that my PhD students and their PhD students will rebuild and knock down again and again. I have an incredibly great quote by Stephen Pattison that I won't say because I feel the, the eyes behind me. Um, but needless to say, it was, it was sassy and wonderful. Okay. Um, 
So as academics, are we discussing theology because we care about the way that theology is able to influence the lives of the disinherited, or are we talking about it so we can maintain a status of prestige, that refable book on our shelf? Practical theology itself is a disinherited child within the theological disciplines, and I believe it is a place where we can pick up the baton at that Pattison describes has been dropped. He says it's been dropped by other theologians. It is a challenge of practical theologians to have their finger on the pulse of the fellow disinherited. In Scotland, this is reflected in a variety of ways that frame the landscape of theology in Scottish history. We write because we are inspired by our context, and there's no other explanation as to why Scotland is producing works that so greatly reflect a call to this disinherited group. A call to show that theology still speaks in the contemporary world, be it in an unconventional or even an indecent vessel. As a wee girl in the Deep South, I grew up immersed in the Southern Baptist Church, as my mother did and her mother did before her. One Sunday, I went up to the minister and said that I was sure I would, or, sorry, yeah, I went up to the minister and said I was sure that I would be a minister when I grew up. He looked up at me and he said, oh dear, that will never happen. Women can't be ministers. And I was really confused. I said, but why? That doesn't make any sense. I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. His response was something uh, that I will never forget. He said, because that is what God said, so that is what we are going to do. So despite my long family legacy, despite my inheritance from my foremothers of this church, at that moment I walked away and I never returned. And perhaps this is a little bit of a backstory on everyone who feels drawn to practical theology. I seem to keep finding this pattern as I speak to my friends who are academics in the subject, a story that reflects some bit of being disinherited by a prevailing system. This is why we are so drawn to giving voice to the voiceless or to challenging the prevailing political systems or to showing how theology sounds, tastes, feels like at ground level, to offering alternative understandings of what research and theology looks like. We are all, despite criticism, we are all educated in the doctrines of the early church fathers and the reformers and the German theologians, liberationists, the feminists, the black and LGBTQ theologians, but we also see the importance of letting humans take these great theological ideas and run with them, to see where they take them, to see how they're taking them informs how we understand God and the world. And maybe that is why we are a group of academics the academy isn't always sure what to do with. And yet, we have somehow navigated a creative survival technique in the midst of that. Our subjects for research are often emotional, erratic, mad, mean, heartfelt, and disturbingly beautiful. And maybe in that, we are getting a bit closer to the ever-present goal of understanding the face of God. Thank you. Thank you very much.